Minority in Parliament questions new employment statistics put out by the Employment and Labour Relations Ministry. Ghana Education Service sets record straight over scrapping of basic education certificate examination. On the international front, Zimbabwe's main opposition group calls of anti-government protests in the capital Harare at the last minute after failing to overturn a police ban. Many thanks for joining us. Let's go to our first story. Now, government has announced a reduction of the country's unemployment rate from 11.9% in 2015 to 71 as of 2019. Employment and Labor Relations Minister Ignatius Bafwewa, who gave the figures at the media press series in Accra, said the Planting for Food and Jobs program alone has created 1,593,000 jobs. Here's a report by Salom. Amenia. Through the visionary leadership of His Excellency the President and ably supported by members of his government and the collaborations of all employment generation institutions, I can confidently say that un uh, unemployment is on the decline. The sector minister maintained that between 2017 and 2019, some 611,397 new jobs have been created in the former sector. The ministry's department and agencies accounted for 343,458 jobs. In addition to these new jobs in the former sector, the ever-famous Planting for Food and Jobs program is estimated to have created 1 million 593 jobs from 2017 to date. He added that a total of 11.6 million, representing 63% of the working age population, are in different types of employment. According to him, 1.14 million people, representing about 6%, are working for own use or working voluntarily, and therefore not considered to be in employment as per the International Labour Organization's definition of employment. He said the remaining 5.36 million are not working because of schooling, incapacitation, domestic activities or unemployment. He insisted that the free SHS has also contributed significantly to the drop in unemployment rate. He explained further. The working population starts from age 15. At age 15, a child had just completed junior high school or junior secondary school. So all things being equal, all those who otherwise wouldn't have continued education will have fallen into the unemployment bracket. But for the free senior high, they are schooling. So you cannot say that they are unemployed. So let's stay a while longer on this story and do a lot more. Now we have some figures here breaking down the number of jobs that government claims it has created. So new jobs created in the formal sector, we have 611,397. Now new jobs created by formal private sector, 267,939. And then new jobs created by planting for food and jobs, 1,593,000. And new jobs created by ministries, department, and agencies, 343,458 jobs. It doesn't end there. Jobs created by MDAs, now Ministry of Interior, 7,000 jobs, Ministry of Works and Housing, 4,137 jobs, Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources, 882 jobs, Ministry of Regional Organization, 5 jobs, Ministry of Aviation, 667 jobs, the Transport Ministry has created 1,254 jobs, the Ministry of Trade and Industry, over 31,000 jobs, Ministry of Sanitation, 600 19 jobs, the Ministry of Defense in excess of 3,000 jobs, and then the Ministry of Food and Agriculture in excess of 1 million jobs, Ministry of Environment 70 jobs, and then the Ministry of Gender 6,506 jobs. So, this is a breakdown of the total figure of the jobs created by government.
Ben Arthur is a labor analyst and he joins me in the studio so we talk more also on this job creation. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Arthur. Thank you. So, first of what you make of this back and forth of the numbers that government has put up when it comes to the creation of jobs since it came into government? Yeah, good afternoon to our viewers. I do not know if we can challenge uh, these figures at all. Mm. It's a bit difficult for anybody to go out there and simply say that these jobs have not been created. You also need to collate your figures just as the ministry has done. I think that if the government claims that it has created these jobs, it could be much more than that because when we talk about creation of jobs, these are the direct ones that have been hired. But there are other ones that are consequential to these ones. For example, if you have uh, 200 people hired and they have purchasing power going up, definitely it induces other sources of employment, which we call the indirect employment. You spoke about the free SHS. Mm. Yes, indeed, if you look at the double tracking and the expansion of the SHS system, it definitely has come with a lot of employment. New teachers have been recruited, non-teaching staff have also been recruited. Those who were doing buying and selling, you know, have also had induced, you know, opportunities. Exercise books, those who are in the area of stationery and the rest. So we can talk about even farmers who are feeding the children and the rest. So we could, okay. by extension, go ahead and talk about many other opportunities. Many other opportunities. That that have been hold it there for me. Let's just head to Parliament where the ranking member of employment, Richard Kwachiga, is also addressing a conference on this same matter. Defines the employed as the total number of workers actively employed or available for work. It consists of all persons aged 15 years and older who during the reference period were in the following categories. I, at work, that is persons who during the reference period performed some work for wage or salary either in cash or in kind or worked without pay. I, I had a job to go back to but did not work during the reference period. By this definition, the employed population includes the hawker on the streets, national service personnel, and those by reason of internship who earn allowances within the reference week of the GLSS report are considered as employed. Those who crack stones for a living are also considered as gainfully employed. It is this definition that the Nana Akufu Addo led government is totally relying on to proudly tout what it calls achievement in job creation. It is therefore not surprising that we are being told that the unemployed rate currently in Ghana is 7.1% of the labor force. The availability of accurate and credible employment data to any country forms the basis of how serious and sincere they are about tackling the unemployment problems facing the country. Unfortunately, this government has proven not to be truthful to Ghanaians and would have them believe that the NPP-led administration has not only created new jobs, but has reduced unemployment in our country to 7.1%. The fact that the officials of this government, including the president himself, keep churning out conflicting employment and labor force figures attest to their level of dishonesty about tackling the unemployment situation. Whilst the president in his 2019 May Day address puts the total labor force at 13 million, the employment minister, just after three months, puts the active workforce population at 17.56 million, which according to him is from the GLSS 7 report. 
So we'll bring you the full story on our subsequent bulletins, but that was ranking member on employment, Richard Kwashiga, addressing some journalists on the number of jobs government has created. Let's come back to the studio and continue with Ben Arthur, who is a labor expert. So Mr. Arthur, let us look at this. We heard Mr. Kwashiga saying that we have people who are cracking stones, also saying that they have been employed or gainfully employed. In this case, how do you measure employment? How do you say somebody's gainfully employment, employed? Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, if you look at the definition of employment and how we want to situate things, we can argue and argue, but ILO has a definition for employment and those who are unemployed. But first of all, the minister's reference is from the Ghana Statistical Services uh, Living Standards Survey round, round 7. So these are not figures that I think the ministry is, is churning up. It's from Ghana Statistical Services. Mm. These figures are available. You can look at the 2015 uh, GLSSR 6. That is the Ghana Living Standards Survey Round 6. We have figures. So if we have any doubts, then possibly we have to raise questions as to why or how Ghana Statistical Service, you know, came out with those figures. So these are figures not coming from a ministry. They are coming from a very credible, you know, Ghana Statistical Services. But we have a loose definition for who the employed is or who an unemployed person is. Yes. And that is an ILO definition, mm. which has come out with a convention uh, ratified in 1982. You know, so this is a definition worldwide that is used. If you are not if you are, you are you are not looking for work, let's say you are you are not doing anything, but within a period of a reference week of about one week, you are not looking for work. You are not actively looking for an opportunity and the rest. We cannot deem you as unemployed. That is one definition. And if you can work within an hour meaningfully, within a very short period, let's say a week, or so we do not deem you as unemployed. So the way we see employment by the definition of having permanent employment and the rest. That is, that is why people think that if you are selling uh, tomatoes by the roadside, yours is not employment. It's employment. But it's employment. Mm. It's employment. Gone are the days when you could be hired as a young lady, 25, and then the next time you exit from your employment place is when you turn out 60 or beyond. Those days are, are long gone. Mm. We are having contract employer employees, we have casual ones, we have the permanent ones, we have, you know, sharecroppers and the rest. We cannot say that these are unemployed mm. persons. So even the casual people who can work and sustain themselves, at least get some income twice a week, three times a week, they, they are, are deemed all employed to be, yes, they are, so, they are deemed. so if you go by this definition strictly, I dare say that the 7.1 might even much less. Much higher. So yes. we, we spoke with, we've been speaking a lot on this issue, and then most of the experts we've spoken with say that in as much as the numbers are high, it will be a bit too early for us to start feeling the impact of the numbers government has given us, looking at the number of people who also come out from artificial institutions and then the availability of jobs. Do you think it is too early for us to start feeling the impact of this reduction that government oh. has said? Oh, yes, I think we have felt it already let me be very sincere with you mm. if at one point in time by policy implementation one is able to hire hundred thousand uh, unemployed graduates mm. that is that is very huge it's huge to the extent that it's not just the numbers that have been hired the families that depend on the allowances that these people draw and related businesses that will be induced by this amount of money that just imagine 100 people, each one of them is receiving the equivalent of 700 Ghana cities. cities. Mm. That is a whole injection of capital into the economy. Mm. So it is not a small thing. So for me, it's not even the direct hirings, the other nuances, the consequential creation of employment. But as I said, our definition of employment is by the ILO. And it does not mean that you must wake up, report at eight, close at, at five. five. That is not that. Yes. type of employment that but perhaps maybe what my good friend wants to say is that he wants to refer to former sector employment but ghana is over 86 percent about 85 percent informal, informal. Mm. so if your mm. uncle leaves you with a boat and you go to fishing and there's off season 
and you are not going any longer. You cannot say that you are unemployed. Yeah, right. Thank you very much for speaking with us. Bernard Arthur is a labor expert. Now, the National Council for Curriculum and Assessment, NACA, has revealed that the Basic Education Certificate Examination, BC, will soon be scrapped from the country's educational system. But the Ghana Education Service, GS, at a news conference maintained there's no immediate plan to scrap that BC. Now, the BC. We are not scrapping BEC. As we speak now, the curriculum is for KG1 to primary 6. So it has nothing to do with BEC as we speak now. You know, but the, the new curriculum also comes with assessment pack. And we have indicated that we are going to have national assessment at various levels. Primary 2, primary 4, primary 6. We are even yet to develop the curriculum for DHS and then SHS. So you cannot just say that you are going to scrap until you, de you develop that and you know the kind of assessment that you do. That is when you make decisions on that. So we are not scrapping BEC. And then also, we will still be having our end of term exams. Peter Pate, Anti is Executive Director of Education Think Tank Institute for Education Studies, and he will be joining us on the phone line. So we talk a lot more about this. Should we continue writing the BEC or it has overlived its experience or its relevance? And so we should introduce new ones. Let us know how you feel about the stories we've turned out so far on our various social media platforms and they will be read live here. Peter Pate Auntie is joining me on the phone. Good afternoon to you, Sam. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. So BEC was introduced some 32 years ago. Do you think it has outlived its purpose for it to be scrapped? Uh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, the BEC has outlived its purpose and it needs to be scrapped. It's the position of the Institute for Education Studies is that as we continue to reform our education sector, what we have to do is to institute an examination that will just guide students in terms of their progression from the junior high school to the senior high school. And that any exam that seeks to be a terminal exam at the junior high school level, whereby the students can both around with a certificate and claim that they have completed, they have completed uh, JHS should not be part of our educational system going forward. What, what do you think will be a possible alternative or the best alternative? The best alternative is that as the student gets to GS, JHS3, the student should be assessed basically for the purposes of placement. You know, the number of basic schools in Ghana are more than the number of uh, senior high schools in Ghana. And therefore, it becomes difficult to determine which school a, a, a student living in DHS should attend. And also, if you look at the government policy, there is the, the, the intention to redefine basic education to include senior high school. So it's going to be a continuous education to SS3. So all that we have to do now is to institute some kind of examination that will be used as a form of placement for the children in their transition from GHS3 to SHS1, and that no child should be allowed to drop out from school as a result of writing an exam at GHS3 and claim that they have completed uh, uh, education. Mm. Mm. So we, we, we've had the situation where we changed some the number of years we spend in school from three years to four years and now we're bringing the discussion also to um, the scrapping of BEC. Have we thought about the discomfort this will bring to the students who are the center of this conversation? No, there, there, there's no discomfort here because as it stands now, the students write BEC but now the point is that they do not use the BEC as a, a certificate of completion whereby they can go out and work with that certificate. That is what the, 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 the intention of the policy is. So what they, when they write the BEC, what they are not are used for is to place them in senior high schools. Senior high schools, yeah. Uh, yes, and, and that, is, that is what we are advocating for. And I think that is what 
uh, uh, the other, other policy experts in the sector are talking about. That we should not encourage a situation whereby students write VEC and they say they have completed uh, 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 their education. But then as soon as they write the VEC, the VEC or that exam that will be instituted at that level to be an examination that will transcend them from where they are now to SHS1 at the various uh, senior and secondary schools in the country. So that should be the purpose of any examination a child writes at GSS3. And not mm -hmm. that, that so exam is for completion of that particular level. Would you suggest a total scrapping of or the process should be facing out? How would you suggest we go about the, the scrapping? <laughs> you see, when, because we are going through curriculum reform, we, we are a little bit laid back and we do not want to uh, stampede the process. So as the, implement, as the uh, designing and implementation of the JHS curriculum begins, we will be making inputs to the effect that as they continue to do the national assessment, so they are now going to do national assessment at stage two, stage four, stage six, and then GSS two. Mm -hmm. Now these assessments should cumulate to the final examination, which will be written at GSS, I, I mean stage nine. And then as soon as they write that, the computer placement and then uh, the, the requisite agencies would take this uh, data from the, uh, the various uh, institutions and then they will use it to place the students at their senior high school level. In doing that, no child will be left out of the education ladder as they progress so they get to SS3. All right. Thank you very much for speaking with us. Peter Pate Anti is an expert when it comes to education. Now, let's just stay with education because the Ghana Education Service has suspended the 10 city insurance deductions for August to allow teachers not interested in the scheme to exit. The Director General, Professor Kwesi Amankwa, made us known at a news conference in Accra. There have been agitations by the various teacher unions over the 10 cities insurance deductions. According to the Director General, 40,000 teachers since the implementation of the policy have picked forms to exit from the scheme out of which 35,000 teachers have had their names deleted by the controller and accountant general. We're giving the staff of GES one month, anyone who is not interested to pick the exit form and they will make sure that the deductions will not affect that person. We we'll make sure that all those who pick their forms, if they are deducted, the refund will be done. In view of this, managers of the insurance policy have been asked to suspend the August deductions. We have written formally to, as of 6 August, Controller and Accountant General, to, for the second time, suspend the program for August. We will resume in September. A month's ultimatum has also been issued for teachers who are not interested in the scheme to exit. After this month, any staff of GES who does not come out to get his or her name removed from the list is deemed to be a member. However, as we have already indicated, at any point in time, if you want to exit, you can exit. Under the controversial insurance policy, all teaching and non-teaching staff of the service who die or suffer permanent disability will be given a cover of up to 18,000 CDs depending on the medical report. Those who suffer illness such as cancer, stroke, major organ transplant and kidney failure would be given a cover up to 9,000 CDs. A critical, a critical illness that renders a member totally and permanently disabled receives the full payout of 18,000 CDs. On MTN Video Report, a seasoned journalist Solomon Ahiable highlights on a road at Adaklu Zakpo in the Volta region, which has been taken over by water. People of Adaklu Zakpo are calling on governments and other agencies to come to their aid as the oiling stream that runs through Adaklu to repair to Adaklu Jakpo. Anytime it rains, they find it very difficult to cross this particular stream. This Kalakpa stream makes it very difficult for the cars and motorists to cross from the other side to the community. Farming activities becomes a hot 
they are therefore calling on government to come to their aid since government and other benevolent people promise to do a olin bridge that can help them but nothing has been done You can also send your video report via WhatsApp 055-1433-044. Media Live returns with more stories after this break. Don't go away. Welcome back to Midday Life. Let's do business now. The Vice President, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, has commissioned a $4.5 million fertilizer blending factory at Isuboy in the eastern region. The facility is expected to produce 800,000 metric tons of fertilizer annually. The $4.5 million facility is being managed by Glowfed. The factory, which employs 85% workers, predominantly from the community, is expected to produce 120 metric tons of fertilizer per hour, which can meet the current 600,000 metric ton local demand. The project, which is part of the one district one factory, is to transform Ghana's agricultural base. Vice President Dr. Mohamed Baobia, who commissioned eight, directed Cocoa Board to stop fertilizer imports. Ghana's demand for fertilizer is around 600,000 metric tons. So this factory can meet all of Ghana's demand for fertilizer. And so today I want to challenge the Ministry of Food and Agriculture and the Cocoa Board that with the coming on stream of Glowfed, we know that the fertilizer blending plants in Ghana can meet our total demand. And, and still have excess capacity. He assured entrepreneurs ready to set up such factories of government incentives. There's a five-year tax holiday, a waiver from import duties and taxes on equipment, machinery, and parts, a waiver from payment of duties and levies on raw materials. Chief Executive Office of Glowfet, Reverend Foster Mauli, gave a hint on the construction of another factory. The biggest fertilizer bag manufacturing plant on the other side of our property. And this will be ready by the first quarter 2020. In addition, we have also commenced the construction of a $600,000 soil testing and agronomic laboratory to aid research into making farming better in our country. One I eight one facilities are the various stages of implementation of the One Day Street One Factory program. Now, the Ghana Revenue Authority intends to develop an e-payment platform to enable employees in the informal sector pay their tax through mobile money and the electronic point of sales devices. The Commissioner General Emmanuel Kofinti made this known at a media training workshop in Kufridia. The workshop, organized by the Private Newspaper Publishers Association of Ghana, PrimPAC, was to update participants on emerging tax issues to enable them to inform and educate the public, particularly those in the informal sector. President of PrimPAC, Andrew Edwin Arthur, urged the GRA to engage in an extensive consultation with stakeholders to avoid the frequent tax loss amendment or repeal, citing the recent scrapping of the luxury vehicle tax. The need to engage in extensive consultation with stakeholders with a view to taking on board their concerns in the formulation of tax laws because the frequent manner in which tax laws have had to be amended or repealed does not augur well for us as a country. The president of the Ghana Journalists Association, Roland Afilmoni, underscored the need for journalists to build their capacity to ensure quality and effective reportage. If DRS succeeds, the economy will grow. And if the economy grows, we will benefit. If you go through our stories and see how well, whether there's been qualitative improvement in the story we write, for the analysis we do. The Eastern Regional Minister Eric Kwachi Dufour suggested periodical audits by the GRA to improve a database and also track those not in the tax net. It is a case 
of us as a country not being able to cast wide our tax net, which has therefore uh, hindered our growth. The Commissioner General, Emmanuel Kofinti, considered the current revenue to GDP figures of 12.3% was poor and could be improved to 20%. It is a known fact that the attitude of large numbers of income earners in the country to the honor of their tax obligations leaves so much to be desired, especially operators in the informal sector. It is my hope you will use your media space to complement the public education efforts of GRU to effect a change in attitude we so much desire. He outlined new plans to get a larger section of the informal sector to pay their taxes. That will enable taxpayers in the informal sector to pay their taxes via mobile money and the electronic point of sale device to help capture VAT transactions on a real time basis. The authority has set a revenue target of 45 billion cities for 2019. That's all for business. Let's do other stories now. President Akufuadu says the increased presence of the Ghana Armed Forces in the Apai East region is to help secure the country's borders. Addressing a debate of chiefs at Navrongo in the Upper East region, the president noted the initiative is part of efforts by government to ensure terrorists do not infiltrate the country to cause problems. <laughs> President Ikofado told the gathering that the soldiers are putting their lives on the line to enable the public feel secure. The president called on Ghanaians to support in terms of intelligence and information gathering. President Ikofado recounted the vigilance of Meshes Grigri Bagbemi and George Bonfondong, members of the Roman Catholic Church in Hamile in the Upper West Region, who earlier this year, together with the church leaders, alleged to the pleas about the presence in the church of an armed person who turned out to be a national of neighboring Burkina Faso. And we need all of us to pull together and understand that the very survival of our nation is what is at stake in this effort that the soldiers are doing. They're not doing it just for themselves. They're doing it for all of us. And I'm appealing to you to stand behind them and give them your maximum support so that they can carry out their duties efficiently and successfully for us. Touching on the One District, One Warehouse project, President Kofaro said, Nine are scheduled for construction in the Upper East region. The president appealed to the chiefs and people to help government combat smuggling of fertilizers for planting for food and jobs program. And it's all of us, our money which is inside the program. It's not just the farmers. People sitting in the offices in Accra are contributing. Those sitting in the offices in Navrongo are contributing. It's not just the farmers. And then we have a handful of greedy people a handful of greedy criminals and they will use our money and smuggle our things to the to Burkina Faso. I am appealing to all of you. It is not right and all of us should band together to stop the smuggling of our fertilizers to Burkina Faso. Now, military and police personnel have seized placards bearing anti-government messages from protesters in Navrongo during President Akufuado's tour of the Upper East Region. On Wednesday, some protesters lined up the streets with placards that summed up the issues with the president and his governance. <laughs> Ahead of the president's visit to the Kasinan Nankana Municipal Assembly, some protesters lined up the streets with placards. These had inscriptions such as, Mr. President, stop renaming and build your own. Mr. President, we want dance, not stuck out. Mr. President, where is our one million dollars? And NPP is a scam. The protesters lined up along the streets to the assembly but the military and police officers were reportedly called in by the Defence Minister, Dominic Mutilla, to clear the protesters from the ground on the basis that those messages were against Ikufado and the government. Some military officers forcefully collected the placards. No 
Jonathan Santiotri is a governance and political analyst at the University of Kipkus and joins me on the phone to talk more. Hello, sir. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Good afternoon, Grace. So you've watched the video. What was your initial reaction? Well, I... Let me say good afternoon. Good afternoon. The people of Avalon as well. Um, I think that my initial reaction was that um, I think the action or the reaction from the soldiers is quite appalling. But it's uh, unbecoming of our democratic dispensation. I think that um, that use of unwarranted force, mm -hmm. more or less like a kind of intrusion into dissenting view. You know, put the soldier or the soldiers or the military in a very bad light. Uh, I'll finally say that as part of my preliminary comment, I think that um, um, it is a bent in the image of the military, and uh, I'll be very much glad if, if the president or, or those who saw the footage uh, could it, shouldn't disassociate themselves from. Yeah, so th there's a seeming concern of intolerance of government among the public. Does this video go to buttress that seeming concern? Yeah, that is the very thing that came to mind because I was equally worried, especially having listened to Professor Nakakai, you know, lamenting on the, on the level at which the, the, the Akufa government is literate in terms of press freedom, you know, and uh, tolerating dissenting views. And something which is quite uncharacteristic, as we need to know, of, of, of our president. And mm -hmm. so sometimes I just wonder if he is, he is visibly aware that things of, of, of this nature are happening in his government. And that is something that, you know, makes all of us worry. What does this mean to the country's democracy? Well, it's really that it's a It's really of the fact that uh, instead of us making progress as far as our democracy is concerned, we are retrogressing in certain aspects of our democracy. Um, I would say that if the president is unaware of this and has not sanctioned it, then he must equally disassociate himself from it. Mm. Or the military, the, the top hierarchy of the military must come out to either render apology and condemn the behavior of the vociferous, you know, involved. enthusiastic soldiers that, you know, uh, 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 that greeted the crowd. Because if you go outside Europe, everywhere, renowned politicians who are, you know, important presidents world over, whenever they go to places, the likes of Trump, the likes of uh, 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 Bush in the past, whatever they were, they, uh, the UN meetings and other things, they were dissenting views. All right. It did not mean hmm. that you should have to attack the people with any kind of force. Okay. I think that the president and the Democrats associate themselves from it. Thank you very much for speaking with us. Jonathan Asante Otri is a political analyst. You are still watching Media Live. We're back with more. Don't go away. So this afternoon we asked, are you depressed and how are you coping? Well, acclaimed rapper Guru is on a mission to help you get better. He spoke to Osu Rai. Relationship related broken heart is real. Feeling of sadness and despair are present daily when things previously enjoyed no longer hold safe. In extreme cases, people experience mental health issues with others taking their lives. Versatile rapper Guru is saddened by the experience. I survived through counseling. I, I survived through the word of God. 
which I believe in. So I hope most of the young folks will get a lot of education about some of these things because the rate which people are getting themselves into Pantai be too His latest single, Suicide, urges the youth not to give up hope but keep trying after a disappointing turn of events. <laughs> You know, there is this fancy side of life where everybody want to have a fiancé and when they break your heart, you just they won't take some body, die your body. So we, we just try to uh, educate them about not lose everything because of a petty relationship. If you fall in love with somebody and it break your heart, just try to slow down and not take your life. The boss of NKZ Music intends to educate fans on how to manage depression. To him, taking one's life is not an option. If you take your life right now, you're causing a lot of havoc to your family. Guru and his team are expected to hit the various campuses, educating the youth on depression and how to handle it. <laughs> The popular rapper who performed at the historic launch of Onya TV and Akuma FM in Kumasi described the experience as a great honor. It's a great honor rapping on this stage. We love the people so much. So what I would say is it feels good being on this stage and I love it so much. Thank you guys. <laughs> And award-winning playwright and motivational speaker, Uncle Abel White, has affirmed the boy called a girl playwright, Kobna Ansan, as his successor in the Ghanaian theatre industry. The two playwrights are known for their insightful stage works at the National Theatre. The chief executive officer of Roverman Production has over the last decade written, produced and directed countless stage plays. On his live flagship program, Food for Thoughts, on Facebook, Uncle Ebowise confirmed who was to take his place when he was no more. For those of you who have been asking me about what was next when I'm gone, I have him here. He's crazy, he said. Kobna Ansa has six plays to his credit and is known for his queer style of telling stories. His latest piece, The Boy Called a Girl, has been the talk of town. Well, that's how we end this edition of Midday Live on TV3, which is also live on DSTV channel 279. My name is Grace Hamwa Asari. Log on to 3news.com and get some other stories. Good afternoon.